Activity that converts commodities to different commodities is called production. So when we take these tomatoes, onions, garlic, chilies, and limes, add some capital like a mixing bowl and some labor by chopping and mixing, we've produced salsa. The salsa is different than the parts. Commodities that are not perfectly interchangeable are called different. Production is the process of transformation to make things different. To most of us, we associate production with manufacturing, but it's much more than the making of physical things. By transforming or moving products from one location to another, trucking firms engage in production. A tomato in California is not the same as a tomato in Utah since they're not interchangeable from the perspective of the consumer. Storage is production because an orange in October is different than an orange in July. So warehouses actually transform commodities over time. And in our economy today, services, which are largely non-tangibles, such as medical care, telecommunications, education, accounting, and consulting, represent the most significant components of GDP. How economists think about production and how they model firms' decisions to produce is the topic of this program of Economics 201. A recipe is a description of the ingredients and proportions that are used to make something. Let's think about bread. A bread recipe is a good start, but to actually make it, we need more than the recipe. In addition to the ingredients, we need some labor to mix. And what do we mix it in? Well, a bowl, so we need some equipment. And of course, an oven. The bowl and the oven are examples of capital. Now finally, since this all happens somewhere, we need some space, like a kitchen. Land, labor, and capital are the classic categories of the inputs that go into making something. That something is called output or total physical product. We can represent production in a very simple way. Production transforms primary inputs such as land, labor, and capital into output. The process of making a loaf of bread defines production. And since there are many different ways of making bread, there are different production processes or what we call technologies. When we talk about production, we want to address some key issues. For example, if I use a certain technology and I double all the inputs, will my output double or not? The answer relates to the scale of production. Secondly, are there different ways of producing the output? For instance, by substituting one input for another in some way. This relates to factor substitution or the choice of technology. For example, I could substitute this bowl and some of my labor and use a bread machine. Because firms want to engage in production to make a profit, they are interested in cutting costs. How does that relate to technical efficiency? Well, what that means is that firms seek the best ways of transformation with minimal waste. If we were to compare two methods of production, one efficient and one inefficient, the technically efficient method would use less resources. Well, since resources aren't free, that would be the cheaper way to produce, or the more profitable way to produce. We'll analyze production and describe efficiency in the context of perfect competition, our theoretical model. In this model, technological information is transmitted to all firms equally, so the level of efficiency is the same for all firms. In other words, there are no trade secrets. And all the level of technology changes through time, We'll make a simplification for now and hold time fixed. So we analyze production with a given state of information that's available to all firms. Let's begin by looking at an individual firm and think about a period of time when some factors of production are held constant. Typically, these might be some sorts of equipment and land. In our bread example, the fixed inputs might be the number of ovens or the mixing bowls we happen to have. When some factors are fixed, the firm is producing in the short run. We contrast that with the long run, and that's when all factors of production can be varied, like, for example, leasing more space or buying more ovens. 
Well, we have some equipment that's fixed. Now let's add some variable factors of production, such as raw materials and labor. Now imagine how output changes as we vary these inputs. The short run production function is a tool to help us visualize the relationship between the input and the output. Mathematically, we might represent it like this. The quantity of bread is a function of inputs, some of which are fixed for short run production and some get to vary. Of course, we don't want to waste precious inputs, so this function shows us the maximum amount of output we could obtain using the inputs. Here's an example for our bakery. To keep things simple, we'll focus on one varying factor input and relate that to output. The table shows us the maximum number of loaves we could produce in one day for between zero and six employees. With no employees, there's no bread. So let's add just one employee. Now our bakery can produce 10 loaves. So the first employee adds 10 units of output. When we hire our second employee, output jumps to 25 loaves. The difference between 25 and 10, which is 15, is the contribution to output of the second employee. Is that because our second employee is more productive? No. For now, we're assuming all labor time is identical. So the difference is not between our second employee. What it does reflect is the nature of the productive process and the level of fixed inputs. For example, our first employee would be responsible not only for making bread, but for answering the phone, taking orders, cleaning up, and ordering ingredients. With an additional employee, we can take advantage of specialization, so productivity increases. With three employees, output jumps up again to 35 loaves but the jump wasn't quite as large as with our second employee. The contribution to output of the third is 10 loaves, just like with the first employee. When we go up to four employees, output goes up by only five loaves, to a total of 40. Well, look what's happening now. Our fifth employee adds only two more, and by the time we have six employees, output has tapered off completely. Well, what's happened? What's happened is we've reached the limit or maximum capacity of our bakery. In this case, our fixed capacity means our workers simply can't accomplish anything more. And if we went beyond this, output might actually decline. In analyzing production, it's informative to compute the marginal product of each employee. That's the increment or additional unit in terms of bread that each new employee contributes. The marginal product of labor is defined as the change in output divided by the change in labor. So to compute it, we take the difference in output, the numerator, and divide by the difference in input, which is the denominator. For our example, the denominator conveniently changed one at each step, so the marginal product was easily computed by just taking the difference of the next unit of labor, because the denominator was always one. You want to be careful, though, because that's not always the case. You may recognize that delta Q over delta L is the slope of the total product curve if output is measured on the vertical axis and labor on the horizontal axis. If we plot the total physical product curve, or production function, we can see that the slope of a line tangent to the curve is measured by marginal product. Notice that as we increase L, the slope of the total product curve goes up and then starts going down. This is a characteristic of many production functions. When marginal product is going up, we say that returns to the factor are increasing. If marginal product remains the same, then returns to the factor are constant. An important economic law states that a common characteristic of short-run production functions is that there's a point at which marginal product will decline. That's called the law of diminishing returns. For the bread example, we hit diminishing returns at the third worker. Why is this? It's because various scales of production have a sort of natural or comfortable level of utilization. When we push capacity, we overextend the capacity and output just doesn't respond. If we underutilize the natural scale, then production is somewhat sluggish. The general shape of the total product curve is that it rises yet flattens out. Its rise is because of efficient production. More input is associated with higher output. The flattening is because of the law of diminishing returns. 
It was first described by David Ricardo. When we read a newspaper or listen to the news, we often hear about productivity. Generally, that's a reference to how much stuff, on average, a factor input, such as labor, can produce. Now, that's called average product. It's the average amount produced by each unit of a variable factor input, and easily computed by dividing total product by the factor input. Let's go back to our bread example. To compute the average product of the first employee, we take total output, which is 10, and divide by the number of employees, 1. So the average output per worker when we're producing 25 loaves is 12.5. At 40 loaves, average product is 40 divided by 10, or 4. When we're using 5 workers, output is 42, so average product is 8.4. And with 6 workers, it's 7. A graph reveals that average product follows marginal product, but doesn't react as quickly. Average productivity will increase if marginal productivity is above the average, and will decline if marginal is below the average. So imagine your economics class. It has an average height, say, of 5.5 feet. Now, if a new student enters the class, called the marginal student, the average will go up if the new student's height is above the average, 5.5. The average will remain the same if his or her height is exactly the same as the average and will fall if the marginal height is below 5.5 feet. Now here are some very typical graphs showing the relationship between the total, the average, and the marginal product curves for a generic production function. We see that as we vary the factor, output increases and at first quite rapidly, then more slowly. This phenomenon is captured by marginal productivity, which goes up and then goes down. Average product follows marginal product, but is not as responsive. Average product is a maximum when marginal product is equal to average product. Because our firm is interested in making a profit, it will choose the technology that's cheapest. So the choice depends on the price of labor, the wage rate, and the cost of capital. And here's how we do it. Let's say the price of labor is $100 per day, and the price of an oven is $50 per day. Technology A uses four employees and one oven, so the cost is computed as 4 times 100 plus 1 times 50, and that's equal to $450. Now, Technology B uses three employees and two oven. Now, we compute the cost of Technology B as 3 times 100 plus 2 times 50, which is equal to $400. So for this example, a profit-maximizing firm will choose technology B, the capital-intensive technology. Now if, however, the prices of the factor inputs change, that might not be the best choice. If the price of capital increases to $100 per day, and the price of labor drops to $75 per day, then things change. Let's compute the cost of technology A and TB in this example. Technology A will now be 4 times 75 plus 1 times 100, which is $400. And technology B will be 3 times 75 plus 2 times 100, which is now $425. In this case, technology A will be adopted. Well, notice that when we allow capital to vary, as well as labor, we can begin to think about long-run production decisions. Fundamentally, we think that inputs are somewhat substitutable, that there are many different ways to produce a given quantity of output. The firm, in order to maximize profits, chooses the mix of inputs that are least costly. In the last segment, we talked about short-run production. That's when a firm has at least one factor input fixed at some quantity. Our example was to fix capital and explore how changes in labor affected output. This time, we'll let all factors of production change and explore how firms decide how to go about producing in the long run. The techniques we talk about are also useful for analyzing multiple inputs in the short run. We'll keep our assumption that the drive for profit guides firm decision making. What we'll derive are more formal methods to explain production decisions geared to the least costly methods. In the long run, we'll see that industrialization or using capital-intensive ways of making things doesn't happen solely because of technological innovation. It's because technology becomes relatively cheap that firms choose to adopt it.
Let's say we want to produce a sprinkling system, and that requires digging a trench. There are at least two ways that I can do this. One would be to hire about ten workers with picks and shovels. The other would be to hire a backhoe and a driver. The first method of production is labor intensive, and the second is capital intensive. I can accomplish the same task by substituting one unit of capital for nine workers. The marginal rate of technical substitution is a measure of how easily one factor can be exchanged for another. In this example, it's nine. It's the trade between labor and capital that keeps production the same. Now let's generalize a bit and use a graphical model that you're familiar with from consumer theory. Our model will allow us to explore the substitutability between factors of production and to see how optimal choices are made. To help, consider the following data showing a two-variable production function where we vary capital from zero to three and labor from zero to four. The data show us that labor and capital can be mixed. Let's go down the column that corresponds to one unit of labor and then vary capital. With one unit of capital and one unit of labor, output is 5. With two units of capital and one unit of labor, output is 10. And with three units of capital and one unit of labor, output is 15. Something else is interesting here. To produce 15 units of output, we can use three units of capital and one unit of labor, two units of each, or three units of labor and one unit of capital. So in other words, we can produce the same amount of output by choosing different combinations of labor and capital. So in this particular example, labor and capital can be substituted for each other. Now let's graph the data. On the horizontal axis, we'll plot the quantity of one factor input, such as labor, and on the vertical axis, another input like capital. Now let's plot the combinations of labor and capital that give us the same level of output. For example, the pairs 1, 3, 2, 2, and 3, 1 correspond to an output of 15. In this region, capital and labor are perfect substitutes with a marginal rate of technical substitution of 1. Now all that means is that when I reduce capital by one unit, I can maintain output at 15 by increasing labor by one unit. These three points line a curve called an isoquant. This curve shows us all the possible combinations of inputs that give us the same level of output. Typically, inputs are not perfect substitutes, so isoquants bow towards the origin. If inputs can't be substituted at all, then isoquants form right angles, an extreme sort of bow. We can generalize and plot isoquants for any given level of output. In our example, two units of labor and three units of capital fall on the 25-unit isoquant, as does the combination with three units of labor and two units of capital. Our complete isoquant maps look like this. The marginal rate of substitution refers to the slope of the isoquants. Remember that the marginal rate of substitution shows us how much additional input is required to maintain a constant level of output when we reduce another input by one unit. The segment you are about to watch contains numerous algebraic formulas. Viewer discretion is advised. Let's generalize this. When we reduce labor by some amount delta L, output will decline by delta Q. Recall that the marginal productivity of labor, the MPL, is defined as delta Q divided by delta L. So the loss in output will be given approximately by the equation minus the change in output is equal to minus the marginal productivity times delta L. Now what we want is the loss to be picked up by an increase in capital, delta K. So we multiply the marginal product of capital by the change in capital. Here we see it as delta Q is equal to the marginal productivity of capital times delta K. To maintain output, which means to stay on an isoquant, the loss has to balance the gain. So we equate minus delta Q, which is equal to minus the marginal productivity of labor, times delta L, and that has to balance the change in output, which is equal to the marginal productivity of capital times delta K. Or we can rewrite this equation as the marginal productivity of labor times the change in labor must be equal to the marginal productivity of capital times the change in capital. When we divide both sides of this equation by delta L, and then by the marginal productivity of capital, we arrive at an expression of the slope of an isoquant. That's given in this equation. 
the marginal rate of technical substitution is equal to the change in capital divided by the change in labor. And these, that's equal to the negative of the marginal productivity of labor divided by the marginal productivity of capital. Now, what does this have to do with minimizing costs? And now it's time for Chalk Talk with your host, Miss Sarah. Now we're going to talk about isoquants and cost minimization. A firm has a choice of different technologies using capital and labor to make a quantity of, say, 15 units of output. So any of these combinations of 15 of capital and labor will yield a quantity of 15 units of output. So now the firm has to decide which of these combinations of capital and labor to use. And they want to use the one that's cheapest, the one that's cost minimizing. So we have our cost line, which is the price of capital times the amount of capital plus the price of labor times the amount of labor that we use equal our costs. And our cost line might look something like this. The cost line is just tangent to the isoquant. It only touches the isoquant in one point. This would be the lowest cost way to produce the quantity of 15. There's another isoquant, or another cost line, say here, but those are higher costs. Even though we could produce quantity of 15 two different ways using that level of cost, it is not the cheapest way to do it. This would be the lowest cost line, the cheapest way to do it. Now let's say that labor becomes more expensive. What will happen is, is this cost line will rotate inward. And then it might be tangent to the ISA cost at this point here. So when labor became more expensive, we use less labor and more capital to produce our 15 units than we were using before. The formula for computing cost is the total cost is equal to the labor cost plus the capital cost. Or the total cost is equal to the price of labor times the quantity of labor plus the price of capital times the quantity of capital. Now we can algebraically translate this equation and see it's an equation for a straight line. Here we write it like this. Capital is equal to total cost divided by the price of capital minus the ratio of the price of labor to the price of capital times the quantity of labor. Hmm. So the vertical intercept is total cost divided by the price of capital, and the slope is the price of labor divided by the price of capital. Now what happens when we vary the parameters of this line? Well first, let's change total cost and keep the slope, which is the price ratio, the same. As total cost increases, the line shifts in a parallel fashion upwards to the right. Now, when we change the price ratio, the line rotates. If the price of labor goes up, the line becomes steeper. And if the price of capital goes up, the slope decreases. You might recall that the cost line is just like the budget line from consumer theory. In consumer theory, income shifted the curve and relative prices affected the slope. Well, now we have two graphs with the quantities of the factor inputs on the horizontal and vertical axes. Now we have the cost line and the quantity curve. Now, when we superimpose the set of cost lines over an isoquant curve, we can determine the optimal quantity of labor and capital that minimizes costs, given the desired level of output. As we move from point one to point two in this diagram, our costs of production fall from TC1 to TC2. If we keep going from point two to point three, costs increase from TC2 to TC3. Now at the point of tangency between the isoquant and the cost line, costs are a minimum. There's another way to look at the decision the firm can make. 
and that's to maximize output for a given expenditure. For example, let's say our firm has $5,000 to spend. What's the best way? Clearly, since profits are related to revenues and revenues relate to output, the firm wants to maximize production. It's always better to have more than less. To figure this out, we plot first the $5,000 cost line along with a set of isoquants. Just as with cost minimization, the point of tangency between the cost line and the highest isoquant curve gives us the optimal mix. Isoquants can also show us how a firm will optimally choose inputs with increases in output. Here is an isoquant map for 50, 100, and 200 units of output. Let's keep prices constant and trace the least costly method of production. The trace is called the firm's expansion path. It shows us the least costly mixture for any level of output. Well, how does the short-run production look? Well, let's fix capital in the diagram at 5 units. If the firm wants to increase production from isoquant 1, 15 units, to isoquant 2, 20 units, it has to use 5 units of labor. So the short-run quantity is at 5,5. Five. Notice that this isn't on the firm's expansion path. So in the long run, it can increase capital to 6 units and use 4 units of labor to produce 20 units of output at a cheaper price. In future segments, we'll explore long-run decisions in more detail. For now, why not review? What we've found is that the behavior of firms depends on two key variables, the cost of the inputs, or the factor input prices, and the technology of production, or the productivity of the inputs. We assume that the firms produce to maximize profits, and in this segment, we've concentrated on choices that minimize costs. Isoquants graph combinations of inputs that produce a given quantity of output, and isocost lines show the combinations of inputs that yield a given total cost of production. The slope of an isoquant is called the marginal rate of technical substitution. The slope of an isocost line is equal to the negative of the price ratio. To minimize costs for a given amount of output, the firm chooses inputs such that the isoquant is tangent to an isocost line. Remember, this is symmetrical to what we found when analyzing consumer behavior. There, we saw that consumers maximized utility when the slope of an indifference curve were tangent to a budget line. In consumer theory, we went on to derive the demand curve. So our next task is to derive the supply curve. It's an easy step. Mm -hmm.